One Education is sponsored by Participate, a community learning platform where the world learns together. Later in the episode, we'll hear about one of Participate's partners, The Sandbox, and how you can get involved in its free community learning opportunities and live streams. So you have a thermostat, Mike? A Nest I, thermostat? I do. Well, not anymore because I'm taking it down as soon as oh, I get off the damn podcast. <laughs> Welcome to On Education, part of the On Podcast Media Network. My name is Mike Washington. And I'm Glenn Irvin. Friends, we have an awesome pod for you today. We will discuss what our least favorite education words are, whether we believe it's important to get out and experience the world, keeping our kids safe while using ed tech. And our guest this week is educator and author Kristen Matson. So in a in a COVID twist, mm. Cheryl and I both got vaccines in the last since since we've last spoke hey man i i i it's amazing gotten, uh sh- i i got my vaccine and cheryl got hers cheryl got hers as part of um uh, a, a drive to vaccinate teachers uh, teachers specifically yeah. in certain in certain regions of ontario that were were spiking okay. um and she teaches in one of those regions um even though they closed schools, so they closed schools in Ontario. If anyone doesn't know, like we're Ontario oh, is a dumpster fire now. Wow, um, I didn't you know, know that. Uh, you know, it's it's so schools are closed, um, and there is a wow. and there is a stay at home order. So so I we've had, had no idea. Cheryl teaching and the kids home um 24 7 how it's long back has it been? To basically it's back to basically the way it was Last a year, year ago right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's crazy. So um, Cheryl got vaccinated as on on the Sunday, mm. um, uh, um, last Sunday, and then what's funny is on Sunday night, they announced that they were opening up the AstraZeneca age group in Ontario to anyone forty and and older. Um, so I was like, "Hey, that's me!" <laughs> you know, so I called. I win. I yeah totally I called um right away Monday morning um last Monday morning got um got an appointment Tuesday afternoon Mm. and it 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 kicked the absolute crap out of me in fact Mm. I'm still kind of feeling like garbage from from it um from recovering you know but that being said um months earlier than I was expecting me to get vaccinated Hey. Um, so super happy about yeah. that for sure. That is fantastic um, news, man. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, bad news about the going back to complete distance learning. Cause it feels like we are on the yeah. other side of that, but I mean, plenty of kids still get quarantined. We still get, uh, you know, big chunks of kids, but it feels like we're just forging forward. Um, no matter what, if almost kind of through the end of the year, at least here in Minnesota, and uh, though in the cities, they, I know that they barely got back to hybrid slash in-person learning. And, I, and you know, in some states, uh, as I saw Andrew Revelo post, this is the first time within this last few weeks that they've been back to face-to-face or in some sort of hybrid since last year in, you know, during this time when, yeah. when, when, wow. we, were, when we were here talking about it. So it's been a variety platter for... For a lot of us, so well, yeah, yeah, that's counting great. On, counting on the, I'm um, I'm really counting on the borders being opened, um, sometime in August. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, it'd be nice if the borders could get opened. Um, I'm suspecting that, um, we will have full normal kind of back, to, fairly normal back to school in September. Um, I would be surprised if we went back to in-person learning for the rest of the school year. Wow. Um, to be honest. Um, Dang. And then, you know, I I don't don't tell anyone, but I'd actually like to go on vacation during Christmas break next year. <laughs> so, um, that's so kinda, hopefully that happens, huh? <laughs> that's where I'm gonna pool all my all my karma into into that making i'm going to manifest that isn't that what the kids yes, say yes you can make it happen something to happen <laughs> the universe the universe is going to conspire to 
Hey, they, I would I would be a hundred percent behind that, man. That would be amazing if we if it would if if next December things look semi normal, man. Yeah. I'd take so, that in a second. So we skipped some stuff last week because we had such a I mean the podcast last time was an hour and a half. Yes. Uh, which is it was, the it was a two episode two two week episode basically. It took it you so two weeks long. to get through it. It was so <laughs> long. Um so we skipped a whole bunch of stuff um that we wanted to talk about. But uh one of the things we we wanted to make sure we got back onto the schedule was a, a fun thread on Twitter by one of our our, our good friends, uh Mike Dresick. Yes. Um and he asked, What is your least what is your least favorite education related words? Um, his was rigor, which you also very yeah, much dislike. I, I knew I knew I love Michael. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there was a, a lot of engagement on the the tweet. There were some yes. really fun ones like on the same page, um, which I am also done with. Yes. Um and, Words we've talked uh, about learning loss. We've talked about on this uh, podcast, you know. Sure. Yes. Sure. Um, what else do you like on there? You know, there? things like differentiated instruction, which I, I mean, I don't have a problem with that word, I guess, but some people have a problem with it. I guess pivot. I'm, I'm done pivoting. <laughs> I just kind of want to go that way now. Uh, please, <laughs> pivoting is pivoting is done. Um, that this one's funny. Hyperdocs. Um, yes, remember that. I, I I can't believe people still use words like that. Yeah. Um, it's like, you know, every document now is a hyperdoc. That's what's so funny about it. It doesn't like if you use a digital document. I'm talking about like a Google Docs. Every one of those documents is now a hyperdoc. Right. <laughs> We've hyperlinked everything to those documents. We we figured it out, and now it's not that cool of a thing. It's called that's what we do. <laughs> Uh, deep deep dive i actually like saying deep dive sometimes i, deep I take dive, deep huh? dives i don't uh, hear that i don't hear that i hear fidelity a lot yeah and that's that's what uh noah geisel a uh, friend of the podcast said fidelity is the f word <laughs> 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 capital so, f says michael <laughs> one of the uh one of the more um long conversations that actually happened in that thread was was um, part of a conversation with myself um, yeah. and and Eileen uh, Winokur, um about engagement and and I oh, and yes. I had wrote the engagement and I had wrote I honestly don't think teachers know what the word means and I stand by it come at me um, <laughs> I'm not going to rehash all of the really <laughs> dumb ways that we refer to various things as engagement in yeah. 2020. And in 2021, engagement, but yes, it's engagement word, has I think. jumped the shark, <laughs> um, officially, and I am done. You know, it's the obvious irony is that it's it. I am the director of engagement for yes, participating. I, <laughs> so, I knew that. I knew that. That's fun. <laughs> but the way that it is used in the in the education vernacular. Yeah. is just so off the mark mm. engagement La can but i can it, but I it's rant? our own fault should i, should too, I rant it all about this or should i just leave it alone i don't well, know Well, you can rant right after i talk about it i think it's actually our own fault i think oh, uh sure do you remember i actually and i know you clearly do because you were attending conferences at a very similar time that i was like when you were presenting at isti uh about minecraft Yes. A long time ago. People people that talk about Minecraft Education Edition, come on. There was this thing called Minecraft way before any of that stuff. And a lot of people were using just regular old Minecraft. And yeah, then we're the OGs of exactly, Minecraft. We were education. super OG. Anyway, the 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 concept of using it in your classrooms, like Mike was presenting at is the which one? Thirteen? Fifteen? 14? Okay, four, 13, 14, 15, somewhere in there. Yeah. But but do you remember those conferences? There was a lot of sessions that had to do with, I'm going to put it in quotes, engagement. But you know what it was? It was entertainment. Yes. It was yes. not engagement. La laughing is not engagement. So they were like, they were, they were, 
basically making those two words synonymous, right? Yeah. And that was bad. And we sold people on this. Yeah, yeah, engage, you know? And it actually is, like you said, it's not the meaning of the word. But now it's gone, you know, 180 degrees. People are like, I don't want that. That's not a, that's not something that we want in our classes. But what they're talking about is not engagement, it's entertainment, like entertaining your kid. You do want your kid. Of course you want your kids to engage with the materials and engage and be engaged in class so that they are able to go ahead and, you know, have discussions. They're able to go ahead and receive the messages that you're that you're talking about and able to participate and really uh, learn. Obviously, if you don't, if you never engage, you never learn. You're not going to actually learn. So that's why it's it's hilarious. I think we did it to ourselves. So tell us more, Mike. Well, no, it, it's just in, engagement <laughs> is an action, right? Mm. Engagement requires reciprocity. It requires yeah. conversation. Engagement is when you um, actively um, participate in your learning and in the learning of others. Yeah, it's it's. Having fun in class is allowed, obviously. I want my students to have fun. I want my students to laugh. I even want my students to laugh at me. Um, You know, I don't, none of that bothers me. That's all great. It is not engagement. It's a different word. Just Mm. use the proper words so that we know what the hell people are talking about because, um, you know, being fun and playful and joyful and Mm. entertaining in class is is great and some of the outcome of that might be engagement but it's not engagement itself engagement is an action it is an act you have to engage with things like captain picard turning on the starship yes. enterprise to go <laughs> you have to engagement means go engage yes and that's <laughs> what engagement is and i'm so glad i got to bring up i'm i'm so happy captain you picard. brought in that great star trek reference there. <laughs> <laughs> so um you know there's there's a lot of really really good words there for sure um I, I need you to fill me in on what's happening on Padlet. Um, and this is a really crappy story, I yes. imagine. It's it's a really... it It's bad because of what occurred. Basically, a student was... Um, it's maybe many, many students. At least there, there was one as far as in the article that we'll make sure we link in the show notes. But there's a news uh, article about a student having in- interaction and being basically exploited sexually, a young minor, uh, by a adult. And it happened on the EdTech platform Padlet. And if you don't know Padlet, it's, it's a great EdTech tool. It's web-based. There, It requires no login. Uh, to be able to reach the Padlet, you need a link, basically. That's all you need. Uh, and you can post basically on a Padlet um, uh, brainstorming notes. Um, you can go ahead and post um, your thoughts and ideas, etc. In, in class. And of mm. course, in this per, for this purpose, the, the perpetrator was using it for something obviously uh, really evil. The problem comes in, I mean, as far as the article, you know, they're talking about, you know, Padlet, evil, and whatever might be, you know, in, in the news uh, uh, thing. The problem is, is that there's a, a multitude of things that you that a student can use, and there's an outside potential outside force, evil person or people that can have communications with your kids. And I mean, I'm yeah. talking about everything from Google Doc to sure. social media platforms. I mean, your sure. students and your kids are on social media platforms where there are evil people on there. Um, Snap everything from Snapchat to TikTok to everything else that students are currently using to have their, uh, that's where they live as far as social media. But you Mm. don't even need that. There's uh, everything from like as simple as a Google Doc to websites that have a chat on the side. To remember, Mike, before the big change in YouTube, 
there actually used to be some really creepy stuff going on in just the comments on YouTube, uh, YouTube, oh, yeah, YouTube videos. YouTube comments were a cesspool. So, so when they turned those off to make them kid safe, that that was happening too. And, and YouTube, obviously, and Google found that out and, and shut those off. So the biggest thing that we can take away from this, from this incident and from any of these incidents is is digital citizenship. And you guys should continue to listen to the, this specific podcast because our guest, Kristen Matson, talks about that in her book. And she herself is, is discussing how we can't be afraid to have these conversations, number one. But number two, we need to educate our kids. Like, what do you do? You know, not avoid all of this stuff because you can't avoid everything. I'm sorry, you can't. We live in this digital age. You're not going to avoid everything unless you go, uh, you know, live in the forest by yourself. And even then, I'm thinking you're still going to end up with some kind of interaction. So for our kids, we really have to make them um, digital citizens. How do you do that? And what potentially what is out there? And then what do you do when this ends up happening? And in this case, this girl reported it to her parents. So that was a good, a good uh, situation as far as being able to address it. And then the school knows, and then obviously Padlet, the company knows that there might be some things that they can fix on their end so that this mm -hmm. doesn't happen as far as on their platform. But I'm telling you right now, this is, that's like, there's a million ways for this to, to occur. And it's super scary. Yes. But we need to talk to our kids and our students about these things that they're potentially there. And so what, what do we do? What do we do to avoid it? What happens when we do end up interacting with it uh, even by accident? So um, it, it, it's a good article or a good thing to be reminded of on a consistent basis. Yeah. So can I admit something yeah. to Go you? Ahead. Yes. I don't fully understand the aversion to the term learning loss and lost <laughs> year. So, <laughs> so let me, let me explain, let me provide context okay, okay. to that. All right. Before people bash you. <laughs> we use the term learning loss for decades, decades. It's something that has been studied. There's, there's, there's tons of studies that that show that students um go to school and then they're off for the summer uh -huh. and then they come back to school um having not retained um some portion of content um that they learned the year prior agreed so that teachers have to spend the first month of school recapping and sometimes reteaching what was prior knowledge mm. that's well documented i i don't you can't you can't argue with that that is like that's a fact those are facts right there this has been we've been using the term for decades um there is and there is a documented citable peer reviewed amount of percentage of time that teachers are taking to reteach things that were taught the year prior every year it varies based on a lot of things but this is something we've been talking about for a long time so i'm trying to wrap my head around why the aversion to the term now because um, I got, no, wait, I've got some because, reasons why. <laughs> yeah, good. I, I was counting on it because I'm not I'm not <laughs> against it. I just don't fully understand it. Again, I'm the words matter guy. And so I'm not saying that I'm opposed to being opposed to saying the term. I just don't fully understand the narrative that, um, you know, it was fine to talk about learning loss um, from 1980. 2019 and then all of a sudden in 2020 talking about this thing that we know actually does happen um you know we can't talk about that anymore um or i can't certainly can't use the word without getting skewered on twitter and that um it, it it's it's not a thing anymore 
I don't know if before that, from your 1980 to 2019, if it was just okay to talk about it. Because I heard that comment or that terminology and what exactly what you stated, you're right, is a fact. Yes. But what people do with that specific set of data mm -hmm. is they exploit that specific thing because it makes sense. I'm not spending time at school learning academic knowledge for two and a half months. And when I come back, I have lost some of that because it just, it's going to be, that's part of being a human. What happens though, is that there's several different things, even before this year, and this year has been where the piranhas really came out. But before that, there's been a move by politicians to push things like uh, year round school. That was a huge push. Uh, probably 10 to 12 years ago, I want to say when when I was at the kind of the beginning -ish of my career, it was a huge push uh, to be more like Japan, to be more like China where there was less breaks so that students could retain more knowledge so that students could become better academic super people, just like the Japanese and the Chinese were. And what we have found out, I think, and as far as in research, probably too, and actually from some Chinese uh, educators, I, there's one specific one I can't think of, but he did a keynote along with George Kuros at, at one of the conferences local here. If anybody remembers that, make sure we tag us on that. But basically, he was a he's a Chinese professor, and he said to this audience of thousands of people, he said, you don't want to be like China. And he listed out the things that China does. And one of the things was keep kids in school for long periods of time every single day and throughout the entire year for the purpose of attaining content knowledge, right? He said, you want to continue to be what you are. And he's talking about people in the United States. And, and he said, you know, you may be wondering, like, what is that? What is that thing? He's like, you have developed and created all of the innovators, the people that think outside the box, the people that said, screw school, I don't care about that kind of thing. You have developed, you have created the environment where you have these things. He goes, why do you want to go ahead and be this people that only think within a box, within this, this, this specific box? And I can't remember the guy's name as far as the professor but that, that was actually speaking to us. Anyway. The exploitation of that data, of, of, of a specific thing, what you're describing is a fact. You're right. But it, it makes sense. We spend time away because, and we're going to lose content knowledge. What do you gain, though, during that time? That's the biggest question. Like, what do you actually gain? And there's a disproportionate things that end up happening during the summer. And that is a fact, too. Uh, there is a group of us, and I would say the privileged white people that end up, their kids continue to read all summer. They continue to go ahead and have experiences because they go on these vacations and whatever else it might be. And there's a group of students who don't, and they maybe don't uh, engage with academic materials. They maybe don't do all of the things that you know people that are privileged get to do. And there is a discrepancy between that. And that is a problem. But the biggest thing that pisses me off about this kind of thing is in this kind of thing is that people then, by people I mean specific politicians and then specific corporations latch onto these terms and then say to the school, hey, your kids are they they're deficient in these things. So now we're gonna sell you X. Yeah. That's, I get that. that's the part that's when you have this time news article and that's where we're going to make sure we link you guys to this post by Angela Kunkel who said she's disappointed in the time cover I saw the time cover and I was just like this is disgusting in so many ways there's so many levels of disgustingness about that I love time magazine we get it at our house it says the lost year how the pandemic changed a generation of students it may be an actual fact I get it. It is a fact. It, it it did change. It changed the world. It has. It continues to change the world to this moment.
but you put an African-American young student, female, on the cover, and it's selling a narrative, a specific type of narrative, a storyline, a, a thing, which that's what magazines do. I understand that too. But what it's also saying is that teachers, education systems in general, have failed this student. And this last year was a wash. You can just go, that's gone. It's like, you may not pick up the content knowledge to go from what the, the specific standard said, you're going to go from this to this during that year. That is a yeah. fact. You may not, yeah. that may not happen, but the students continued to grow in a variety of different ways. And probably are more uh, capable now, I would say, than a lot of different generations of students of being able to handle adverse situations of all kinds. And this year has shown us, and we've we've gone through it as far as on the podcast, not only, um, you know, th the pandemic, but all everything else that came with this past year, how insane this world really was this one past year, but also amazing in many ways. There was a, so much tragedy and then so much things to look forward to and hopeful to. So, I mean, it's like this combination of craziness. If you just yeah. say the year itself and how much we've all learned as adults, but our kids too. And the conversations that our kids are having today would probably never have happened, obviously, if this whole thing didn't end up happening and everything, all the events that's that led to this point. So I just hate the exploitation. I guess that's my that my biggest thing is really I don't like when people then use this to then sell us the next thing, the thing yeah. that we're all going to end up buying the curriculum, the tech tool, the thing. And I hate, too, that a lot of at tech companies out there are putting that on their list as one of the marketing items help uh, deal with learning loss. A lot of yeah. the conferences, Mike, are headlining that. How do we address learning loss? You know, that's like one of the things I'm just like, I just want to throw things because it's like the sponsors do want, to, yes. want to address learning loss with this thing that we can sell yeah. you for four thousand dollars but you are right i mean overall you're what you've just finished describing you're exactly correct because it makes it it not only makes sense but it is it is a fact that over a period of time you're you're just gonna lose that specific you know those skills the skill yeah. set whatever they're gonna deteriorate as you go through time my, um, my son my son is in grade seven yeah. There is a portion, a probably a larger portion than normal of grade seven math that my son will not retain next year going into grade eight. Mm. I, I, you know, and whether that matters to you is a different story. And that's a whole other conversation. Sure. And how that data, that information, that knowledge gets exploited to sell, you know, a math catch up curriculum for yeah. four ninety nine to the school <laughs> is 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 the problem that we have with talking about learning loss. Mm. But to suggest that my son is going to retain every piece of grade seven math that he could have possibly learned in the classroom in the same calendar year is ridiculous. It's it's wrong. It's it's just not factually correct. I just mm. don't. So, um, and, and I, all the other things I, I get, I, yeah. I, I think it's a wording issue that I'm struggling with that we've, you know, we've understood what this means. I, I think the definition of the words changed in the last year where people just didn't, you know, it's like, oh, we don't want to call it a lost year because they learned so many other things. Yeah. Um, even though the actual like learning loss that was researched was related generally to math specifically and then to other subjects, um, non specifically, but definitely related to math. Um, cause that's what you can like actually like you can document that. You can yeah. document learning. You can test loss that math. very easily too. Very easily. Yeah. 
Um, so we just don't like the words anymore, which is interesting because, you know, there are a lot of words that are changing in our cultures and our societies and our wor- worlds right now. So I, I get it. Um, it's a good discussion. It is. It is. Um, so I, you know, don't, don't at me. Um, I'm, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with, with what we're talking about and why we don't like the idea of learning loss. Um, you know, I, I get it. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a dummy. I just, I just think the conversation is super interesting. Um, mm. I, I, I talked about wanting to go on a vacation and, and it, you know, what's funny is that just before, literally just before the pandemic, probably January, 2020, um, when, uh, I was feeling real good about a lot of things, new job coming up podcast had, uh, like almost 10,000 downloads, January, 2020. Mm. I mean, things were looking way up for us <laughs> <laughs> who would have thought um but one of the things that i did um was i actually started a spreadsheet um of all of the places that i wanted to go mm. on vacation travel to heck yeah and and i actually created a rubric for <laughs> how bad i wanted to go there based on a, a number of different factors that's a that's a super nerd way to do oh it. yeah yes. no i was into it <laughs> and there was a scoring system so that i could like triage you know places and then I and then I started to ask Cheryl, like I wanted Cheryl to do the same with the same spreadsheet so that we could see where we wanted to go. Mm. And we wanted to start traveling. And uh, our boys are, are five and 12. Isaac will be 13 soon. And it was like, we want we want them. I want them to get out and see the world. I don't want to live in. I, I, I mean, I'm probably going to live in southern Ontario my whole life, but it's like. I, I, I want to go places. I want sure. to do things for sure. And I want to take them with me, um, when we can. Um, so this idea, this question that, that has come up, do you think it's important for our students to, to see the world, uh, from our friend Corey Graham? Mm-hmm. I, I, I felt like the answer was automatically yes. Um, so, uh, you know, is there any, is there any no to this? I actually think there's a lot of people that say no. And and it's and I don't know if like you put it, it's it's maybe a Canadian versus an American thing. I have no idea about oh, that. Oh, there's definitely some of that too. I have no idea if that's actually the case, but I will tell you one thing, it for sure is it's a rural versus city kind of thing in the United States. And there's a there is a I what I call it a movement, but not really a movement, but maybe just a tradition. Let's call it a tradition of Growing up in a specific town area, going to a local school, as I think Corey actually said it really well as far as in the in the post following the original one and saying, I actually want to go to school kind of locally in the community college and then come back and work in my community. And there's something to that, too. There's something positive about that. I can see that. And there's nothing actually negative about that specific line of thoughts. But what Corey was saying is in that process, should we be getting out and like experiencing some different things and and doing some things? And of course, I put yes, that we should for sure be doing that. Audrey Thornborough put that yes. um, You know, she talked about her husband living in Australia and South Korea. She used to live in Italy, that it was that that made a huge impact on on them uh but i actually love paul dervasi's comments he's also a former guest there he said he doesn't actually think that travel specifically is necessary to broaden one's world view or to create intercultural understanding but it helps but he said it really depends on what mindset you bring to that. And that's actually what I've seen. I've seen a lot of Americans that travel to different countries. So, for example, I used to travel to Costa Rica and take students there all the time. And not my students, but other people, other Americans that would travel there. The the interactions that they were having with the culture was mm-hmm. very, I'm an American and there's this, you cater to me i'm not here to learn about you or questions like why would you do x you know instead of going like in your culture this is important to you that's amazing instead 
it's kind of criticizing their decisions and their lifestyle, et cetera, whatever it might be, which is funny coming from an American to a Costa Rican society that just is a beautiful, uh, not only country, but everything that they've managed to do in their country is just freaking phenomenal. <laughs> um, but it, it does happen. I think it's a, it's a sp specific mindset. And I wish for all people to be able to go ahead and not only travel, but to learn from other people, because that really does broaden your horizons. And even going to a university really changed who I was. That was one point which for sure changed the person that I grew up being because that was more uh, influenced by my family. And then I ended up changing a lot during when I was at college. And then of course the years after that too, but I, I think it's important for you to be exposed and not only that, but interact with a variety of different people, especially outside of your comfort zone, your culture, because in the end, it will help you to em be empathetic and empathize and be able to try to put yourself or at least try to go at least have the acknowledgement that I can't actually understand where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. And so I have to do so I have to do some learning, which we've talked about on the podcast before. Like I can't mm -hmm. I, I can't relate to that, but I want to understand. Um, and that's a huge step. That's a huge step in the right direction. The opposite would be what I feel and do and what I've experienced is right. And whatever is on the outside is not right. And it's, and it's wrong. And, and too often that's, that's uh, of, of the viewpoint of too many people. And, and man, that's a hard place to have a conversation from, you know, a hard starting point. Um, mm -hmm. So I, that's why I think it is, it, it is a really important thing, but I think a lot of people don't believe that Mike, they are like, why would I travel? It's like, huh? I have everything I need right here. So uh, <laughs> we'll leave you uh, with this uh, one thought. Um, and this was my response to Corey. Uh, and this was that uh, off the record once, um, fairly recently, uh, an ISTE executive told me that they do not remember it, ISTE, the International Society yeah. for Technology and Education, International society okay yep. <laughs> told me that isti is always in the united states because americans don't own passports <laughs> and we they don't will not still. and they will not travel um and so i fact checked that yeah and the fact is that only 42 percent of americans have a passport and I find let's, that let's, let's, I find that super interesting. Well, okay, but you're also a Canadian, right? And most Canadians live on the southern border, correct? Yes. Yes, that is a fact. That's also a fact. And most Canadians have traveled or do travel into the United States. Do you guys need a passport to come to the United States? Yes. Okay. Most Americans don't live on the northern border right? No, I, no, it's a giant country, right? Exactly. Yes. And, and for a long time, until just, I would say probably within the last, uh, at least 10 years, maybe before, before that, I know there was some law changes. We didn't even need passports to go to Mexico. Uh, we maybe we had that agreement with you guys too. I think we did. We, yeah, we could just have our driver's license. We just needed yeah. our driver's license. We made some yeah. kind of agreement where we could just travel. Yeah, I think I didn't have a passport so. before. And I went to Canada um, for a canoeing trip. But you got to understand that. But that's like, it doesn't surprise me that that's the fact. Yeah. But so my challenge. You, yes. My it doesn't challenge surprise me. To my American friends. <laughs> if you're listening. <laughs> Get a passport. Go get a passport. It's it's a good time. I'm, I I bet you the lines are short, um, because no one is traveling right now. They come visit you. But guys. Uh, if it's anything like Canada, your passport lasts you a long time, probably five five, five to ten years, years. Yep, ten years maybe. Um, I mean, I think you're gonna get on a plane sometime in the next ten years. I mean, you're gonna be allowed to. I, at least I think. So, um, go somewhere. Um, and tell us uh, all about it uh, yeah. when you do it. That would be lovely. Um, I go places all the time and tell you all about it. So I think you should do the same. I'd love to live vicariously through you, our listeners, um, 
traveling. So go get your damn passport, <laughs> Americans. It's um, a great way to end the episode. <laughs> go get your damn passport. That's right. <laughs> when we come back, we had a fantastic conversation with Dr. Kristen Matson. So stay with us. We are building this virtual community of educators who share an interest in game design and teaching new skills. We will use this space to connect, collaborate, and innovate with Sandbox. That's Sebastian Bourget. He's the co-founder and chief operating officer at The Sandbox. This community is here to provide guidance, support, feedback, and suggestions on how to best use The Sandbox within the context of teaching and learning how to make video games. It allows also to connect experts and educators bringing together existing creators and members of the Sandbox game platform community with professional educators. The Sandbox community has grown into a vibrant space of 100 plus educators. How can you get involved? More to come later in the episode. Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Dr. Kristen Matson is a wife, a mother of three, and a former English teacher and school librarian. She's currently an adjunct professor with the University of Illinois and a consultant. She partners with educators in all content areas to integrate digital literacy, research skills, creation, and innovation in the classroom. She's the author of a new book, Ethics in a Digital World, and we're thrilled to have her with us on the podcast. Welcome to On Education, Kristen Matson. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, this is our pleasure. Yeah, it's such a great book, Kristen. We live in incredibly polarized times, and our students are caught in between teachers and parents who might be on extreme opposites of the ideological divide. Uh, you can see I'm starting you with an easy one. Yeah. <laughs> How do you suggest a teacher navigate these sort of waters where getting on the bad side of some vocal parents could cost you your job? And even if the parents are clearly passing on lies to their children and bringing those lies to school. This is a complicated time for teachers. And so complicated. I, I can't tell you how many times this topic comes up. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think there is a magic bullet or a quick fix. If there were, I'd be rich and famous and that would be amazing. But uh, I do think long term, we have some probably pretty serious discussions to start to have around curriculum and instruction and how we're going to navigate these waters uh, in the future because things things aren't going to get better unless we really start to purposefully uh, integrate these types of conversations and skills and lessons into the classroom. I think for me, the most important thing to remember is that it's not our job as teachers to uh, like convince students of any particular political ideology, political or uh, ethical lens. Um, our job is to really help students kind of navigate all the murky waters themselves, um, read, understand, listen with empathy, and mm -hmm. eventually come to conclusions that they're comfortable with themselves. Um, I don't know, I also just recognize that, you know, as an educator, I'm really just one small piece of a student's political, you know, political like makeup yeah they're getting influences from everywhere mm -hmm. um i think our job is to really help students understand those varied influences uh and really like start to figure out what it is that they want for themselves and you know what's funny i, I think about teachers all the time too like i mean 74 million people voted for donald trump 74 million americans voted for donald trump and in the face of, you know, 81 million Americans and, you know, most of the rest of the world, including this Canadian, um, believe, you know, that, you know, this was one of the ri most ridiculous, dishonest administrations anyone's ever seen. Not to get too political. Um, <laughs> I was like, am I allowed to show my hand on this show? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do. 
don't worry about it. We don't. <laughs> our audience expects this at this point. Love it. Um, at least for me, anyways. Um, but you know, we have to believe. We have to acknowledge as educators that a lot of other educators voted for Donald Trump. Right. Right. And so. You know, you have educators in schools who don't believe that there is systemic racism, for example. Right. That Derek Chauvin should have been innocent, for right. example. Yep. That um, that the election was a fraud mm. when it clearly was not. Like, I mean, right. ha- like I, it's 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 well, an insane so world that you're living in right it now. It is. And so we're at this like really tricky place where we have skill sets that students have to learn that the generations before them did not have to learn. Um, There's some really fascinating studies about like which groups of people tend to share the most misinformation online. And it is our youngest students, like our our middle and high school students. And what do you think is the biggest group of people that tend to share misinformation online? Older. it's generation. older people. Yes. Yeah. It's it's like yeah. the 55 to 75 year olds who, you know, for a really long time were able to just take everything that they read, saw, consumed at face value and were not critical questioners of content. Boomers. And so yeah. <laughs> so when had I had to about... had to people sorry, just side note, you might not listen to them. I have a real hate on for boomers. So, <laughs> so Glenn Mike, even Mike put it a, in the Mike, notes of Mike the, has a long the rant notes of the about, podcast. As soon as you were I, talking, I was writing boomers now because boomers. Was gonna, <laughs> I knew he was gonna up. say it. Well, and so like we've got, you know, we have we have these really critical skills that students must have, but do the adults that end up in front of these students, whether that is teachers, parents, grandparents, do they have the skills to help kids navigate all of these things? So I feel as though we're coming at, um, you know, we're coming, we have to come at this problem through a multi-generational approach. This cannot be something that we just start to talk about with students. This has to be something that we're talking about across the generations, which is difficult, but necessary. For sure. Uh, Kristen, you've actually written about this next topic that I was going to ask you about, uh, digital citizenship. And yeah. it is a critical issue being talked about daily in all of the schools, probably around the world, I would imagine right now. Especially um, now with everyone being remote. Absolutely. And yeah. Mike and I were just discussing an incident that occurred on an ed tech platform where a student, a young student was being uh, exploited sexually. Ah. And there's just all of these levels. I mean, Mike just talked yep. about political situations uh, and, and those and, you know, the, the lies that may be a misinformation that are being spread. Mm-hmm. So it leads to this question that you actually wrote in your in your book and you and you had a great response for why should we engage our students in conversations about tech ethics and i think that's a great question we've we actually brought on um, jordan shapiro i don't know if you're familiar with him but he he basically was speaking to us and he's also written a novel specifically about kind of how we can't be afraid as parents and as educators to have these discussions with our students and really bring to light what is actually out there and what you know what steps you should be taking when these things are going to occur so then what should you do Um, can you tell us more about that the engagement of our students in these kind of tech ethics yeah for sure so my original uh doctoral work back in i don't know 2015 2016 i looked at tons of middle and high school curriculum that had been labeled as quote unquote digital citizenship curriculum. Um, By and large, it was really about behavior control on the part of students. Mm. So it was things like, don't post anything that is going to keep you from getting a scholarship or from getting into college. Don't give out your personal information, like very much a list of, of, um, things that that students should not be doing when they move online. But what we haven't really done a great job with is empowering students, I think, um, to engage in ways that are safe, savvy, um, 
you know, purposeful, when the only messages that students hear are, you know, be kind online and tell an adult if something doesn't feel right. We haven't really equipped them with skills to handle things like sexual exploitation, like misinformation, like, um, you know, even a really heated debate that might happen around a topic on the internet. And so my first book really started to push people to think about um, not not talking about digital citizenship like a list of rules, but really what skills do we need to equip students with so that when they are in digital communities, because they all are and will continue to be, um, that they can do so in a way that is uh, beneficial to them. With digital ethics in the second book, I really started thinking about these bigger societal questions. I think that that Mike was kind of alluding to with that first question. Um, you know, things like just because we can create self-driving cars, does that mean we should? Um, do the algorithms that run a lot of our social media systems actually benefit us as you know, consumers of content? Or are those algorithms there to make profit? I think we know the answer to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what's the danger in that? You know, um, when a technology product is designed strictly from a capitalistic lens, how does that impact all of us as end users? And so <laughs> it's, it's kind of twofold for me. I want students engaged in these conversations. One, because all of them are digital citizens already. They're all users of technology. And I want them to be like, to be critically thinking about the tools that they choose to use, how they choose to use them and how they are engaging with others in these digital spaces. But the second reason I think it's really, really important to start having these conversations with students at a young age is that they are the next creators of our biggest innovations to come. Um, yes. And I really want this next generation to be thinking about the human impact of any type of new technology that we end up with, not necessarily just designing to move fast and break things or make a ton of money or, you know, be the next big name in Silicon Valley. I want our students thinking about, you know, what are the, what are the, what's the human fallout from all of these different tools um, that they both use and will someday create. So it's important, I think, just to give them space and time and resources to think through these really muddy waters. So talking about muddy waters, <laughs> <laughs> in the book, you discuss privacy and there is um, a chapter called how much data are we willing to give up? Yeah. And I'm an instructional coach. I also work in tech integration. Okay. Um, and anytime we, uh, you know, we have a list uh, and, and, and laws that govern um, what we can and can't purchase, right? And yes. what tools our students are allowed to use. Yeah. Uh, COPA compliant and so on. Um, but, and then, and just in the normal social media world, there's a lot of hate for specific social media sites, specifically, yes. let's just say Facebook, you know, right. like everybody knows, oh, Facebook's evil, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, and as I wrote this question, I was thinking about one of my biggest concerns and one of the things that we've discussed as far as in our school district, but we don't really have, we don't really have a solution. And, and I don't think that too many people are looking at this, but one of my biggest concerns is a different giant tech company that gives us in many school districts throughout the country and probably throughout the world, we don't even give it a second thought because uh, while we are giving up all of our data for free, we get to use all of their products for free uh -huh. on a daily basis. And it's connected to basically become the probably the thing that most businesses end up using. And so the company I'm talking about is Google. Of course. And so, and so we at our school, for example, um, we use the Google Suite. Uh, yeah. We we have um, our students are using all of their different tools, so they're using Google Drive and Gmail and so on and so forth. Um, and we're being told, at least by <laughs> the execs at Google, that they won't be using this information, you know, these things for <laughs> anything malicious. Right. But it's still super scary. <laughs> the amount of data, yeah. as you put in the book, you were you were you have some very good definitions about uh, you know 
big data and, and data collection and what does it actually mean and kind of the things that we should be talking about and questioning at least. So I'm asking you, uh, should we be concerned about all the data they could be potentially collecting from us and have collected from all of us, but specifically our students? That's the one where, I, I mean, we willingly give this stuff up, whether we know it or not, We're, we are having a relationship with them. We are giving up the data for the use of these tools, but we're also giving up the students' data. Um, and if so, if there is a concern, is there anything that we could actually do about this or are we just too far down in the relationship where it's like, you know, we have to basically trust uh, these giant corporations and specifically that one. That's the one that concerns me the most because they're so embedded in everything that we do as, as far as in the United States. I know that yeah. you know, every school. For sure. So as you were talking, I was writing down all sorts of things <laughs> that I wanted to talk about because I okay. feel like this is a... This is a topic that I could probably teach a semester long class around uh, awesome. with with high school students because there's so much I think that people, first of all, don't fully understand um, and that maybe people think about on a personal level, like how many times have you heard somebody say, well, I don't really care if Google has all my data. I have nothing to hide. Yes, how many I've times have you heard that, right? <laughs> But, but are people thinking about this on a societal level and what all of that means? Are you guys familiar with turnitin.com? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So like the plagiarism it. checker, right? <laughs> turnitin.com yes. is essentially a plagiarism checker who has built this really, um, you know, expansive product and service that makes money every single year off the backs of our students. They do. How yes. do they build their database of information? They build their database of information to check papers against by keeping the papers of the students who turn them in on turnitin.com. And so I think the bigger question that we really maybe should be talking about when it comes to privacy is like, how willing are we to allow these massive companies to continue to, you know, make make profits off of our students. And I think the profiting piece is maybe a bigger concern for me even than the privacy piece. I remember like 10 years ago, 15 years ago in schools, there was conversation about should we let, you know, local businesses put up yes. advertisements on our football fields, you know, I as a way that. to yes. raise funds. And people were like, oh, that feels so icky. Do we really want to be advertising to kids? And then we hand them a Chromebook and the Google <laughs> Suite. And we, you know, everything is, is so branded and good on Google, right? Because if they can get our kids invested in these products early, they've got customers for life. Um, mm -hmm. But it is all very messy. And and of course, we do benefit. I mean, Google's tools are fabulous. They've allowed distance learning to happen. But but yeah, I mean, that's why these questions are so fascinating because there's not a right or wrong answer. There really isn't. Like, they're just messy. A um, couple other privacy things, though, that I think about that are outside of school, but I, I would love to get our students kind of thinking about these things. Do either of you have like a Nest camera at your house or a ring a doorbell like or? Uh... <laughs> I don't, but. So I used yes. to have, a, I used to have a Nest camera as a baby monitor mm. um, um, for a while. We don't anymore. I have, I have two Nest, I have a Nest thermostat and two Nest uh, fire alarms though. Okay, so I was, I've been reading this book, I'm not done with it yet, called... Oh, God, you're going to make me replace all my fire <laughs> alarms, <don't>... aren't you? <laughs> no, maybe your cameras, <laughs> but to. not your fire <laughs> alarms, no. Um, so I've been reading this book called Surveillance Capitalism, and I don't know if you guys have seen the documentary, uh, oh, what is it called? It's on Netflix. And it, social the Social Dilemma? Dilemma. Thank you, Social yes. Dilemma. I, I have something to say about The Social Dilemma quickly, just Do so it. you know. The um, company that I work for, Participate, is actually just starting to do a whole bunch of work with the Center for Humane Technologies, which is awesome. the producers of The Social Network. So you actually might be interested in um, just stay in tune to what we're what we're doing with them because we've just uh, we've just started to work with them and it's we're 
we're all super psyched. That is awesome. You need so to connect we, we've all, with... It was uh, like a company company homework was go watch The Social Dilemma yeah. last, and well, a couple and from weeks a, ago. You know, and from a media literacy <laughs> perspective, I have to ask all those questions. You know, like, what's the purpose of this and who's behind it and what's the message? But I do think it opened a lot of people's eyes to kind of the behind the scenes of um, some of the ways that the products they use every day operate mm-hmm. that... that really surprised people. I would say you have to connect with uh, David Ryan Polgar. He is with a group called uh, All Tech is Human, and he's doing some amazing work to begin to sort of bridge the education gap that exists right now between college programs and the types of things that Silicon Valley is looking for, specifically in terms of, of technology ethics and uh, like sustainability and, um, you know, just kind of all of those different humanity type questions that Silicon Valley maybe wasn't so concerned about uh, 20 years ago. And so he's doing a lot of work to build some really cool, um, really cool bridges between education and tech companies. But back to your Nest camera. Oh, God. And the way this all came out, so Social Dilemma um, interviews the author of this book that is called Surveillance Capitalism. And the author is Shoshana Zuboff, and she's interviewed in The Social Dilemma. Um, But she basically talks about how there is now this entire industry of surveillance um, that somehow manages manage to just kind of materialize out of nowhere like i do not feel unsafe in my community i do not worry about people creeping around my house i do not worry about packages being stolen from my doorstep i realize that's a luxury but then i drive around my neighborhood and i recognize how many people have security cameras on their doorsteps and Mm -hmm. i start to question and wonder Do you feel safer with this technology? Did you not feel safe before? What's the impact of like all of these eyes on us as we start to, you know, move as I'm moving around my neighborhood and I'm I'm getting pictures snapped of me, you know, every few houses from people's ring doorbells. It really just it's like this chicken or an egg kind of a scenario, right? Where like, am I now suddenly more suspicious because I can tune in and see that someone was walking by my house? What impact does that have on us as a society in terms of like social trust, um, social privacy. There really is just no expectation of privacy anywhere anymore. And it's interesting to me that we've all kind of bought into this notion that that we have to surveil our neighbors as well. Everyone's uh, afraid of porch bandits. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Those Amazon packages. That's what it is. Just and get left right on kids. the porch. And ding dong ditchers too. Yes, like, right. <laughs> I this got rem- your I got your teenager on camera ding dong ditching me, and now I'm going <laughs> to call the police. Problem. This this reminds me, Kristen, of a conversation we've had her on a couple of different times. Aud- Audrey Waters is correct, right, Mike? Yeah, I have, yeah, I have I it know, right. Audrey. Yes, love yeah, Audrey so, Waters. <laughs> and so this conversation about um, how we've bas- we've given up all kinds of different privacies, including mm-hmm. in this case our images and the constant video feed of who yeah. we are and yeah. Mike's baby um, <laughs> for the baby <laughs> for the feeling of being secure right. but they're selling us on that specific uh, you know that that's what we need you know yes and what you were just talking about turn it in we're having that specific conversation right now which I'm super happy that you just said that because it brings up another point I think it's gross that we do this you know as far as spend so much money on to that try product to catch when, kids cheating. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It, instead of ch- teaching the skills necessary to be yeah. able to, to Properly develop, to create your own, integrate create your and own, synthesize. Yep, exactly. Yes. Create your own ideas, you know, yes. d- uh, develop your own things. And then also use those monies because we have these ed tech monies, let's call them, yep. to invest in things to be able to allow our kids to create yeah. You know, instead, we're trying to catch them. Dude, yep. it just feels so gross. Turn well, it in. And there was lockdown whole, browsers. I, yeah, just, I was going to say there's yeah. like a whole new industry yeah. now of of folks who are trying to come up with these gotcha type solutions for Absolutely. at home learning and at home testing. And mm. um, 
yeah, are we? Ugh. Yeah, so we it's gross. we get <laughs> we get emailed at least a couple times a year um, by the PR company for Turnitin and by the PR companies for all of these other you know plagiarism checkers to, to have their the CEOs on the podcast. <laughs> oh They're yes. just dying to come oh, on our podcast for some reason. Um, so <laughs> I don't know why. No thanks. <laughs> so what? So that I, I I delete the emails, so I'm not we're not having them on. But what would they say? Why does their product exist? Like obviously we know, but what would they say in face of the 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 issues with like privacy and 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 ethics and stuff like that? What do you what do you, what is their position? Do you think? I don't I don't even know that they've. I don't even know that they've thought about a pitch in that direction. I think it's, you know, capitalizing. Oh, they really don't want to come on the podcast right? then. <laughs> I think it's just capitalizing on, you know, that expectation that kids are going to cheat. Kids are going to take shortcuts. Shortcuts are bad. Cheating is bad. Here, we have That's the fear. solution to help you with all of those things. Yeah. Um, you know, I... <laughs> Being an adjunct at uh, a university and then I also adjunct at a community college, there is a plagiarism checker built right into the uh, the LMS that yeah. I use at my community college. And, you know, I wrestled with like, how, how do I utilize this tool? Because I am forced to use the tool. How do I use it to the student's benefit as opposed to this gotcha? So if there are teachers that are listening that are utilizing these tools, um, you know, I have really started to use it as like a teaching opportunity. So I will send a report back to a student and I'll say, you know, look at these few places where, you know, you didn't use a direct quote, but your words look a lot like these words from your source. And so maybe you should go take an appointment at the writing center and have the writing center show you how you can properly cite this or better paraphrase it. Um, but I also know that right. I have colleagues that would see a report like that and be like, mm, automatic F, you're done. Um, and so it's, I think it's a, a teacher mindset for sure, but for the people who are in positions of power and can choose, you know, where to spend monies, let's not keep feeding companies who are just making profits off of our kids. It's gross. Um, so you have a thermostat, Mike? The Nest I, thermostat? I do. Well, not anymore because I'm taking it down as soon as oh, I get off the damn podcast. <laughs> no, I just... So I read a really fascinating article last week that... Um, that talked about the terms of service for a net ther uh, a Nest thermostat. And I, so a oh. little bit of context. I was shopping for a robot vacuum around Christmas time. And my oh, husband was laughing at me because I really wanted to know about the data collection and the data sharing. You want to know if iRobot knows the floor plan of your house? Of course iRobot knows the floor plan of oh, my house, baby. but like... <laughs> who is I, who is iRobot selling the floor plan mm, of my house to? Yes. And then how are the people that are buying that floor plan somehow profiting off of my vacuuming habits? Um, I or just, lack of. Or lack of vacuuming habits. Um, and so with a Nest camera, if you were to read through the terms of service and look at all of the different partners and places that Nest shares data with, you'd actually have to read through, I think it was something like 55 other companies terms of services to make Jeez. sure that you really are okay with having this thermostat in your home. And that's because of the the data sharing that happens behind the scenes. So I again, I don't say that in a way that's like, oh my gosh, go rip that thing out of the wall and throw it in the garbage can. I just don't think that as a society, we have a really strong collective understanding of what is happening with our data every time we give up a little piece of it. Well, um, they're intentionally obtuse too, correct. right? Like, yes. like data, like data privacy agreements um you know terms of service agreements mm. they're they're written in like it's a Legalese. page that pops it's mm -hmm. a page that pops up that allows you with a big blue button that says accept yep. and your eyes go right to it and you click it and right. you don't even read the damn words no and it's it's done that way intentionally because they don't want you to read 
the words. Right. Well, and they're they're difficult. And so I don't really know yeah. I don't really know any like English class that's like forget Romeo and Juliet this year. Let's dig into a terms of service <laughs> agreement. But like Let's break same it down. complexity, Imagine. right? Same Imagine text that. complexity. Oh, so. <laughs> that's super interesting. Still though. a really the, good the thought, exercise. The thought of doing that, though. That's, actually, <laughs> that's a really interesting and cool assignment. I mean, I mean the kids would probably hilarious. hate it, but it would yeah, be interesting sure. to know. <laughs> but, you know, and again, I like, if, if you understand and you read and you're cool with it like I did buy a robot vacuum um but I want students to be empowered to understand where their data is going how it's being used to make profit and then make a wise decision based on that knowledge um not here to tell anybody what to decide that's awesome so I'm curious if you've seen this this study that that um caught my attention in uh, a while back and and it it came to mind when I was uh, flipping through your your book. In in 2020, uh, a group out of Zurich University um, released a study that compared 18 countries as far as their um, resilience against disinformation. Ah. Okay. And so the best defended countries um, were, were, were Finland, um, Denmark, <laughs> which sort of sounds for I'll get to that in a minute. And the um the UK was ranked fifth uh with a it was a I don't know what the like the there's like a plus minus scale. Um Finland was seven with Denmark at five and UK was plus four. Um the um number eighteen was the United States. Of course um, so eight, it was. And it was minus eleven. So so I'm not sure this numbering scale, but minus eleven generally is you know, less than zero is generally bad in, <laughs> in numbers. Yeah. Um I'm a math expert. Um <laughs> so what doesn't surprise you more, I guess, that that Finland um, a nation that many hold up as a model for education, at least we do in Canada. I yep. don't know what Americans think of we Finnish do. education, yeah. but but in Canada, it's all we talk about is the Finnish education system. Yeah. Um, so Finland, um, top um, in terms of resilience against disinformation mm. on online, and the United States is last. What what surprise? What doesn't surprise you more? Gosh, um, I think the U.S. being at the bottom does not surprise me very much, and that's probably because I'm just more familiar with the ways that we do and don't teach about these things here in the United yeah. States than I am familiar with what Finland's doing. But I even look at Canada and some of the projects that. Um, The Canadian government has really backed like civics. I'm sure you're familiar with that civics project, C-I-V-I-X. A lot of really good work there that helps. I've taught it. It's great. The curriculum's amazing. It is. And there's just, I mean, there's some really interesting things happening in the United States from different colleges and universities and nonprofit organizations. The News Literacy Project is fabulous. The Stanford History Education Group has put out a really great curriculum called Civic Online Reasoning. But the The problem in the United States is that we have so many things, for lack of a better word, that we expect teachers to teach, and we do a really poor job of taking things off the plate, reprioritizing new skills, showing educators how these new skills integrate with things that they've traditionally taught. We tend here to just continue to pile on and hope that eventually, you know, somebody picks up on something somewhere. And so, you know, how how old is the Common Core? Was that 2010? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was gonna, gonna say that old already. Yeah, an, yeah. Epide- an epidemic of misinformation, but God forbid you stop prepping for a standardized test. Well, that's just it. Like we know that what is not assessed is not prioritized, and when assessments are tied to funding, and funding is you know performance is tied to funding, do you blame? schools and educators for prioritizing the things that are on the test versus what's not on the test. I mean, it's it's a horrible conundrum that I don't think we're going to fix until we really rethink, um, 
you know, our national approach to school funding. We rethink what we prioritize in terms of skills and content. Uh, and then we do a much better job training our pre-service teachers in all of these different skills and how to integrate them authentically and not see them as all these little tiny standalones that they have to cram into their day. I mean, teachers are overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed just talking about it. <laughs> For sure. Kristen, fantastic conversation. We're going to have to have you back, and I'm, I'm serious about that. So how can teachers connect with you online, and where can we purchase your book? Yeah, so my book is published through ISTE, and so the ISTE bookstore is a great place to purchase, especially for ISTE members who get a discount. Um, you can also find it on Amazon, and I think that's it for right now, the ISTE bookstore and Amazon. Um, I'm kind of all over the place on the internet. If you just search Dr. K. Matson, uh, you can find me on Twitter and Clubhouse and Instagram and Facebook. Um, I would also really encourage people to do a quick search for the DigSit Doctors. I have just started a new uh, partnership with Dr. Leanne Lindsay out of uh, Arizona. She and I have been doing this digital citizenship thing kind of separately but parallel for many years and the pandemic just kind of brought us together and we were like why are we trying to do this work alone we could be so much more powerful as a team so we've got a lot of really great things uh kind of on the horizon to support teachers in this work because we realize that it is important work and we also realize that teachers need um they need some supports. So DigSit Doctors is my new collaboration that I'd love for people to connect with as well. Amazing. Kristen Matson, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate it. Now go throw away that camera. <laughs> The Sandbox is creating a learning ecosystem where educators can learn in weekly streams, bring ideas into their classrooms, collaborate with other educators, and become Sandbox ambassadors. Our goal for the stream is to show the world how low the barrier can be to teaching and learning game making through our no-code and accessible platform. Anyone can do it. Passion and education. You can feel it in the streams as we explore and share ideas around game design implementation in your teaching practice. Join the community to learn more at go.participate.com slash sandbox. Thanks for listening to On Education. My name is Glenn Irvin. My co-host is Mike Washburn. On Education is part of the On Podcast Media Network. You can listen to this show and many others by great educators like Monica Burns, Mike Matera, Tisha Richmond, and many more by visiting onpodcastmedia.com. Want to get in touch with us? Check out our website, oneducationpodcast.com. You can tweet us at oneducationpod. Mike is at Mr. Washburn on Twitter. And I can be found on Twitter at Herb Spanish. You can find us on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash oneducationpod. We're also on Instagram at oneducationpod. If you're enjoying the show and think others would too, we would be thrilled if you shared it with them. Please leave us a rating or review in Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts. When you leave a rating, it gives our rankings a boost. This helps others discover the show. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, Participate, for supporting us. Check out Participate.com to learn more about them. Thanks as always for listening. Stay awesome and see you soon.